Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good, good. My name's Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, thank you so much for spending part of your weekend um, with us. Thank you to those who parked in the bank parking lot. Helped tremendously. I think we got like 40 cars over there. So thank you all so much for, uh, for doing that to provide space uh, for people who are new here. There's a lot of new faces here. Uh, for those of you who've only been coming a couple of Sundays or this is your first, first Sunday, I'm going to ask a big favor. Um, if you could pull out that care card that's in the seat back pocket in front of you and, and just start filling that out so either Ryan or I can, can touch base with y'all, answer any questions you may have, uh, pray with you, uh, help you with a next move. Um, or for, for anybody else, if you've got someone you're praying for, um, we've got a prayer team and it's, it's our honor to pray for you. Um, it really is. We meet on Monday nights and the team gathers and we, we start praying. And so if you've got a prayer request, go ahead and fill that out. Um, or if, if you've got any questions about Hendersonville Church or you wanna make a next move uh, and, and serve. And also, I just wanna mention, we're coming to the end of our 12-week uh, series or, or whatever you wanna talk, call it on Thursday nights um, where our men's and women's group meet. And, and, and man, I just gotta tell you, God, God has really moved in a huge way. And those of you who are in there, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, this Thursday will be the last time, but we are going to meet again for a three-week uh, marriage event. And so we're, we're so excited because the one thing I can tell you with certainty is the enemy is wrecking havoc on marriages. And here's the thing. The enemy knows if he can tear down the family unit, he can tear down the church. And so what Ryan and I prayed about it along with some others, and we, we know the timing is, is a little bit non-strategic. If you know anything about Hendersonville Church, you know we're not very strategic at all. We just do what God tells us to do. And if it doesn't make any sense, well, I don't know what to tell you. We're going to do what God tells us to do. And he has clearly told us that starting December 2nd, we're going to start a three-week, just a healthy marriage, uh, I don't even know what you want to call it. I'm not sure. Ryan's probably got a better name for it. I just know I'm pumped out of my mind about it. And it, it, listen, if you're married or you plan to get married, you really don't want to miss it. You really don't. Well, Nathan, I don't have time. I can't afford. You can't afford not to. Um, just try your best to be there. Thursdays at 5.30, starting December 2nd. Um, we'll provide a meal, uh, maybe a Little Caesars pizza. Um, beggars can't be choosers. And um, I actually like Little Caesars, so I, I, I'm cool with it. But um, anyway, and then we, we meet, and we'll be out typically by about 7.30. So um, we've been going through the book of Acts verse by verse, and we're getting ready to hit uh, chapter 17 today, but before we do, um, we're going to talk about courage, and speaking of courage, this past Thursday um, was, was Veterans Day, and I just want to ask if, if you've ever or are currently or, or are getting ready to serve in any of the armed forces, do you mind standing real quick? Do you mind standing up? I know there's some here. Go ahead and stand up. Come on. Thank you all um, for your sacrifice. Um, it's a very courageous thing what you women and men have done. This is also uh, unbeknownst to most people in the church world. Thousands of churches right now are gathering together and they're celebrating an event called Orphan Sunday. And what it is is, is we acknowledge uh, the foster adoption uh, subject, uh, the, the way that one way to truly and, and correctly honor Christ is to care for the orphans and the widows. And so if you've ever participated in foster or adoption or you've been adopted and, or you've had any sort of relationship with that at all, respite care, or you've helped support adoption, will you please stand? Come on, I know there's people in here who have done it. Will you please stand? So thank you very much. So basically, Hendersonville Church is, is doing our best to see what God wants us to do to partner with DSS and some other foster um, organizations. And there's like 150 kids uh, in DSS for just Henderson County. 30% of those kids get, get sent out of the county. A lot of times, brothers and sisters get broke up. That's horrible. You know whose fault that is? The local churches. That's whose fault it is. We need 12 families in Henderson County right now. That's what DSS told me. We need 12 families to sign up now 
for fostering. Talk about courageous. That's courageous. So just pray about it. They're going to have, you're going to see some information we're going to put out. I think they're going to have another foster training event in January at DSS. And so if you feel like God's calling you to that, hey, fill out that care card. We'll put you in touch. And, and we would love to help walk with you through that to support people in that. And so, you know, courage. What exactly is the right, the real, the true act of courage? Here's the thing. No one is going to ever influence the world for Christ without it. No one. If you don't have courage, you will not change the world for Christ. It takes a certain level of courage. Paul exudes this. His scars would show it that he has gotten in multiple cities, and he's only about halfway into his second missionary journey. Barely even halfway. You know, his first missionary journey, he's, he's in Antioch. They throw him out. He goes to Lystra. They pelt him with stones to the point they think he's dead. He gets up, wakes up from consciousness, goes right back into the city, teaches Christ and him crucified. Then he goes on to other cities. Then he comes back to Antioch. He builds up the church there. He encourages them. Then he starts on his second missionary journey. We saw yes last week how he was in Philippi and what happened to him there. Literally for casting a demon out of a poor slave girl who, by the way, would have been an orphan. The Holy Spirit led Paul to have compassion on her, cast out that demon. Almost every single theologian agrees that she was part of the church in Philippi, along with Lydia, the wealthy fabric trader, and the Philippian jailer and his family. That was the start of the church in Philippi, which Paul said was the most generous church. But he got beat, had his feet put in the stocks. Remember what those are. They stretch your legs out until you start to rip these muscles right here. And while he's in that situation, he's singing and praising God. That's courage. And, and so t- today we're going we're gonna to look, after he strengthened the church with Lydia, they, they leave. And so we, we covered some very challenging questions last week. I'm going to put them up real quick and quickly go through them because a lot of you asked me about those questions. What comes to your mind when you think of God? A.W. Tozer's quoted as that's the most important thing about you. Not your bank account, not what football team you like, not where you went to school, not your accomplishments. What, is, what are the thoughts that come into you when you think about God? Does God have my full attention? Does he have my calendar's full attention? Does he have my financial's full attention, and if he doesn't, what is it going to take before God gets your full attention? Wise man once told me, Nathan, you better get your priorities straight or God will straighten them out for you. What's it going to take? So today we're going to look at courage, and our main scripture reading is going to be Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 15. We're going to cover the first 15 verses of Acts 17, and so verse 1 says this, Now, when they passed through Amphipolis and Apollina, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, remember, Paul and him left shortly after he was beat, and his muscles would have been torn in his legs. And so, you're talking from Philippi to the first city is 30 miles. From the second city to the third city is another 30 miles. And from Apollonia to Thessalonica was another 40 miles. The way the Greek reads it there, they made that journey in three days, 100 miles. So what most theologians believe in the state that Paul and Silas were in, there is no way they could have traveled. So what most theologians believe, and I agree with them, is that Philippi, probably Lydia, gave them horses. And so they're able to travel through. Now, now here's here's the funny thing. You notice they traveled through those first two cities. They didn't ever preach the gospel there. Why do you think that is? Holy Spirit didn't want them to. For whatever reason, we don't know why. Now, we do learn that there is a synagogue in Thessalonica. So the Holy Spirit may have told Paul in his praying and his abiding time, hey, you go till you find a synagogue. That's the next thing you're gonna do. The problem is so many of us are trying to read a book or we're trying to do more or do this. Listen, every one of us have one next step to do right now. Only one. Don't make it complicated. And it's not read a book, unless it's this book. 
don't make your life so complicated. It would have made no sense for them to travel through a huge city and not share Christ with anybody until they get to Thessalonica. Interestingly enough, Paul, Luke starts to write in third person. So Luke must have stayed in Philippi to, to continue to build up the church and, and, and train and, and, and just help that church there when he's using this. And so Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia, which is current day Greece. Still a city to this day in Greece. It was the most important, a massive trade port, very cosmopolitan city, a lot of different gods, a lot of different things to worship there. And it's to this day, it's still a significant city. So we pick up in verse two, and here's the crazy thing. Remember, Paul's just had the soup beat out of him. And he's probably still limping like crazy from his muscles being torn in his legs by being put in those stocks. And it says, and Paul went in, that was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scripture. Say reasoned. Okay, y'all are like, okay. Next verse, verse three. Explaining, say explaining, and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ, the Messiah. Now, here's the thing. Paul not only had the courage, he had the right content. Here's the thing. You can have the right content and have no courage, and you're just useless. I know. I said useless. That's not a very nice word. That's what you are. If you have no courage to share Christ with people and show Christ to people, you're not a damage, you're just useless in the kingdom. We will give an account for that. But here's the thing, there's a flip side for that. If you have courage and boldness but the wrong content, you're damaging then because then you're preaching a false gospel. Then you're preaching heresy. Then you're leading people down a path that they don't need to be going down. And that's rampant in the church today. And again, we keep things real simple here at Hensville Church. We're going to preach Christ and him crucified. That's it. That's what Paul's talking about. He is constantly talking about this Jesus. When he's writing to the church in Corinth, which we're going to read about in a couple of weeks when he makes his way there, he says this, but we preach Christ crucified. And what does he say? A stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Listen. When we preach, it's going to be offensive to somebody. I tell everybody here at Hensville Church, the only thing I want to offend people that come to 1705 Spartanburg Highway is the preaching of God's word. If that offends them, there is nothing I can do about that. That is between them and God. Now, we're to do it in love. It's grace and truth. Not just grace and not just truth. And so... What I want to focus on is reasoned, explained, and proved. So reasoned, the Greek there, is where we get our root word that means dialogue. So what was happening there, Paul wasn't just preaching a sermon. It wasn't a bunch of people in rows. No, 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 they were in circles. And Paul was letting them ask questions. And they were doing kind of a Q&A type thing. It wasn't just some guy up here saying, this is what the word of God says. And you better believe it. Paul reasoned with them. We gotta meet people where they are, folks. We've gotta cut out this stuff about, well, the Bible says it, so you gotta believe it. Okay, well, the Koran says this. And the writers of the Koran, the people who worship the God of that, they claim it's divinely inspired. You claim the Bible's divinely inspired. What's the difference? Chirp, chirp, chirp. I hear crickets. We gotta be prepared to do that. Next, he explained. In other words, the, the Greek word there is opening. He opened the scriptures and he explained what they meant and with clarity and with simplicity. Listen, we can't use all these big words. I try every time I teach up here. If I use a big word, a teach, a, like a churchy word, I try to explain it in terms to which my simple mind can relate. In other words, sanctification that's a big word. Some of you may not know what that word means. Here's what it means. I'm trying my best to be more and more and more like Jesus. I'm better than I was six months ago. I'm nowhere near where I need to be, but I'm trying to be more and more and more like Jesus. That is sanctification. It is the process of trying your best to be more and more like Jesus Christ was. That's what it is. And that's what Paul did. Last one, he proved. So in other words, the Greek, the Greek connotation there was to set before, 
or, or, to, or to place beside. In other words, he said, hey, here, here's the facts. Do with them what you will. You see, here's what I tell anybody. If they're, if they're super skeptical, and depend on if they're an atheist or, or if they're agnostic or if they're Muslim or you know, if there's some other uh, belief, Orthodox Jewish, you, you gotta change your, your, your rationale with these people. And there's some people that come in here and say, look, I just think it all works out at the end. I think there's some big supreme being and it all works out at the end. Well, what Paul did, he had Orthodox Jews in front of him. So he catered it to the Old Testament. You see, the Jews thought the Messiah, the Christ, when he came, he was coming into a political power and he was gonna lay the smack down on the Romans and, and raise up the Jewish nation. Jesus' followers in the book of Acts, the first chapter, they even said, Lord, is it now time for you to set up your kingdom? They're like, yes, I cannot wait to watch the emperor kneel down before us. Man, this is gonna be awesome. Jesus like, whoa, whoa, not so fast. I'm gonna go away, I'm gonna send the spirit, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so even his closest followers, they could not grasp that Jesus died at their own hands. They couldn't get it. And, and so we must be able to explain and prove and teach what it is. Peter makes this clear to the church. He says in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. How do you do that? Well, he tells you a way right here. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. God never intended for us to hate someone into heaven or to anger someone into heaven because you know what? That's never happened. People need to see the love of Christ, that agape love, that unconquerable benevolence. That's what they've got to see regardless of their choices, regardless of their beliefs. It's our job to love people who don't yet know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's it. That is our job. And so Paul's powerful conclusion was that Jesus is the Christ. He probably would have guided them through like some of the Psalms, like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 that says the, the Savior must suffer. And we were, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement of the world. Paul probably said, look at these. That's what they're talking about. And he most certainly would have probably talked about Psalm 16, which shows, hey, the Savior's body will never see decay. This Jesus rose from the dead. He saw 500 people. And that's what Paul probably did. So you see what the reaction is in verse four. And some of them, meaning the, the Jews in the synagogue, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So Paul, the Holy Spirit, had prepared them. Paul had faithfully preached. The Holy Spirit saved them. And they joined Paul and Silas. Praise God. Almost every single time, success is met with opposition. The enemy hates that we are gathered in here today. He absolutely hates it. He hates that we are worshiping the God the God of Israel, Jesus Christ, via the Holy Spirit. He hates it. He's gonna come at us with everything he can. And so look what happens in verse five. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men from the rabble, that's kind of like the, the, non, the, the unscrupulous, uh, just no moral compass kind of men that would for, do anything for a buck, okay? That's what that means. They formed a mob set the city in an uproar and attack the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. Okay, a little bit to unpack here real quick. So number one, saying there's another king, that's a serious offense in Roman times. That's really what got Jesus crucified because the Jews kept saying he is a king. He is the king. And per Rome, you must worship the emperor. And the problem is what they were thinking was a political thing. And so Rome did not want any sort of, of, a, of a perception that there was any other king other than Caesar. 
because that's how they controlled people. And it's, it's, like I said, it's one of the reasons Jesus was crucified because the Jews kept screaming over and over to Pilate, hey, he says he is king of the Jews. Now, I love, I love the way it said these men have turned the world upside down because what they were saying was essentially true. But here's the thing. It's not that they were turning the world upside down. You see, the world is upside down. And it has been ever since sin entered the world. The world is upside down. The people in Thessalonica who, who were saved, they were turned right side up. So the outside world that looked at any followers of Jesus, just like they're going to look at you and me, is, man, they're upside down. But here's the thing. As a follower of Jesus, we're, we're really right side up in an upside down world. People are going to look at us like we're crazy. People are going to ask us why we do some of the things we do. Why in the world are you loving those people when they're spitting in your face? Well, Jesus was nailed to a cross and they were spitting in his face and he was begging his father to forgive them. And I'm a follower of Jesus. So if I'm going to actually follow Jesus, I got to do what he did. Do, do I want to love somebody that spits in my face? No. The country boy wants to come out in me. I'm ready to. I don't want to. That's why I need the spirit inside of me to overrule my ridiculousness and my flesh. And that's what a follower of Jesus is. So look what they did in verse 8. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And here's the reason why. They knew that Emperor Claudius had already expelled Jews out of Rome by that time because they were causing an uproar. And, so, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So here's the thing, what Jason basically did, we, we don't know much about this Jason character other than he accepted Paul and Silas, gave them hospitality, and when it said they accepted money from him, he basically posted a bond, a commitment that there will be no trouble and my, and my, my friends will be gone. And, and that's what had to happen. And so you look at verse 10, what happens, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Again, these guys don't stop. I mean, they go to Philippi. They get beat badly. And then they travel 100 miles to Thessalonica. And then their friend has to post bond and make a commitment. So Paul and him could not dishonor his commitment. And here's the thing. You do realize sometimes the most courageous thing to do is nothing. Do you realize that? We always have a fight or flight mentality. But sometimes the most courageous thing to do in adversity is nothing. And then sometimes it's to run, it's to avoid the conflict. But with the church, it would be so much stronger if we would do that. I'm so sick and tired of other church leaders using this as a, as a weapon against lost people. I'm tired of the church being known what it's against versus what it's for. And listen, I don't shy from the tough issues. Listen, when, when, when the scriptures cover it, we're going to cover it. Period. We've already had to cover some sensitive things in the, in the first 16 chapters of Acts. But I, listen, be known what you're for. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Love God, love others, make disciples. It was about a 50-mile journey to Berea. Again, 50 miles. Think about that. And here's the thing, this broke Paul's heart to have to leave this newly formed church in Thessalonica. Listen to what he says when he's writing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2.17. He says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time in person, but not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. Ah, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Paul longed to see his brothers and sisters in Thessalonica. What about us? What are you going to be concerned about tomorrow? Getting to your job on time? Getting that report done? Getting the kids off to school? Listen, I'm not saying none of those things are, are not important. I'm not. Listen, the world's upside down. You cannot even look at the news now without nothing but hatred, absolute hatred and vitriol just being just spewed 
by everyone, our world leaders, the news outlets, everybody. Listen, if there's a time in, in my short life where the church needs to be together, it's now. And we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. So look what happens when you get to Berea in verse 11. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. That, when they examined the scriptures, that Greek there, when there was an in-depth judicial investigation, that was the, the degree to which they were investigating the scriptures. Now, scriptures to them would have been the Old Testament. So it would, have been, it would have been, and with the Pharisees, it would have been all the way from Genesis to Malachi. It would have been those books. And they would have been investigating the prophets and the Psalms and, and the Proverbs and, and the Pentateuch, which was the first five books. They would have been examining those meticulously. But here's the thing, their hearts were prepared. See how they were eager? See, the Holy Spirit had prepared their hearts. And here's the thing, Jesus makes this clear when you search the scriptures, listen what he says to the Pharisees in John 5, 39. Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is that they bear witness about me. Listen, every single page in this book points to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Every bit of it. I do not worship this book. I worship the one who wrote it. Please get that right. Please don't say, well, I've memorized this and I've memorized that and I've got up here and I've read these books and I've read these books. Listen, it's about Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what it is about. Please don't miss that. But they had the eagerness to search the scriptures. And so you see in verse 13, look what happened. Success, success is met with opposition. Look at this. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too. These dudes are relentless, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Again, it happened at Lystra. It happened at, at, uh, happened at Antioch. It happened at uh, Philippi. It happened at Thessalonica. Now it's happening in Berea. Paul is constantly facing Fierce opposition, like fierce, like getting killed kind of fierce. And, and so listen what they have to do this time. Verse 14, then the brothers immediately sent Paul off his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, we'll find out why next week, they departed. So here's the thing. This journey was 20 miles from Berea to the seacoast and then 250 miles by boat. And they ain't got one of these, you know, one of those. They, they, didn't, they didn't have those back then. I don't know if you know that or not. They didn't have this. Some of you fishermen know exactly what I mean. Of course, like the real nice boats are this. I get it. But they didn't have this. It was wind, 250 miles all the way to Athens. And here's the thing. We got to remember, look at what Paul has been through. And he's, all it does is further encourage him to fight the good fight. What about us? I mean, this dude gets shipwrecked. He gets beat incessantly to the point of unconsciousness. He would, he would have scars all over his body, all over his body. And so what I want to do, I want to take what we've learned, and I want to apply it, because here's the thing, to have real courage, not the American kind of courage, not the success kind of courage to make a big business deal and, oh, well, I'm going to take a big chance on that real estate or something like that. Not, not, not that kind. Not that kind. I'm talking about real courage. There are some things that we have got to do. Number one, I got to have the right heart. If you don't have the right heart, there's no way you're going to have right courage. There's no way. Scripture is clear on this. When Ezekiel's talking to the Jewish nation, listen what he says that God says. And I will give you a new heart, says the Lord. And a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. See, that's what happens when you come to Christ. You have a new heart. You're a new creation. You have the Holy Spirit dwelt inside of you. 
I know it may sound foreign to some of you, but it's, it's the truth. Jesus even says this in the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You want to see God? Have a pure heart. Period. I love, so y'all have heard me say, read Psalm 37, Psalm 51, John 15. I, I do it every day. I, I've, I've had a lot of people uh, that have done it, and it's amazing how God has used it. Psalm 51 is, is a psalm where we confess our own sin to God, not about anybody else. And we tell God that he's, he's blameless in his judgment and in his words that he uses against us when we sin. It's focusing on our sin. And David says this so beautifully. He says, God, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Listen, this only happens through repentance. It only happens through the realization that, man, oh, man, there is a holy and righteous and just and perfect and merciful God of the universe. And he could be nowhere around sin. And I'm, I'm, I'm eat up with sin. That creates an infinitely wide chasm between God and me. And the only way I can do it is to have a life change and place 100% of my faith and trust in Christ alone. That's it. And let me tell you something. Repentance, it isn't just tears, it's not, it's life change. Your life will change if there's true repentance because the conviction you feel from the Holy Spirit will eat you alive from the inside, period. If there's no life change and you keep doing the crazy things you were doing before you claim to know Jesus, and there's no conviction, if I was you, I'd pull out a care card right now and say, I need to talk to somebody right now about where I'm gonna spend eternity. Because I don't want anybody to spend eternity in hell. Nor does God, by the way. Once I have the right heart, the next thing I've gotta do is vehemently guard it. I've got to vehemently guard my heart. Listen to what the writer of Proverbs says. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Listen, whatever condition your heart is, that's how your life's gonna be. It comes right out of your heart. Writer of Proverbs again in 3, 5 says, trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Psalm 37, 31, the law of his God is in his heart. Look, his steps do not slip. When you have the right heart, you've got to guard it. Paul, when he's writing to the church in Philippi, he says this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will what? It will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We'll get to that in just a moment. Some of you are familiar with King David. God says he was a man after his own heart. God said that. And he ended up being a mighty king that God made a promise with that from David's bloodline would come the Messiah. That's how much God thought of King David. King David messed up big time, committed adultery, committed murder. I mean, he, was, he wasn't perfect, trust me, but he was a man after God's own heart. And when, when, when Samuel, the prophet, is picking the next king, King David was the weakest kid in the weakest family in the weakest tribe of Israel. And look what God says to Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks where? He looks at your heart. That's why I say all the time, the Bible was never meant for information. If it does not transfer from here to here, you're not gonna be transformed. We're gonna get to that in just a second. Jesus says to his followers, and he said to them in Luke 16, 15, you are those, he's talking to the Pharisees, who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is what? <laughs> is an abomination in the sight of God. Listen, God knows your heart. We've got to vehemently guard our hearts. One of the ways to do that is to diligently meditate on God's word. Diligently. 
I love Psalm 119. It's one of the longest psalms. But verses 9 through 13 say this. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wonder from your commandments. I have stored your word up in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forgive your word. That was written by a man who loved God with everything and loved the word that he wrote to him and put it on his heart. So in other words, it transferred from here to hear. So many people let it stop here. So many people let it stop here. And that leads to our next one. Constantly practice God's word. This is where it starts getting a little bit uncomfortable. Constantly practice God's word. There was a time Jesus was teaching in a room. And Mary, his mother, and his brothers were outside and they couldn't get in because it was so crowded. So they come to Jesus, they say, Rabbi, Rabbi, your mom and your, and your brothers are outside. Listen to what Jesus says to them. He answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. And do it. Are you a, are, are, are you a brother and sister in Christ? Are you doing his word? Are you living out? Well, Nathan, how do I know? Well, you have fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 makes this super clear. But the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Do you have a lot of self-control? Are you patient? Are you kind to everybody? Do you have immense joy welling up in you? That's what living out the word of God is going to look like. I love what the church fathers used to say all the time. Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. When necessary, use words. Our actions should preach our sermons every day if we're truly in the spirit. One, one quick way to do that is the next one. Do life with and teach others. And here's the thing, we've got such, we've got such a, a backward view of discipleship in America. We think it's this multi-pronged approach, read this, read this, man, do this, do that. That's not discipleship, y'all. It's not, not, the, not the discipleship that's in here. It's not. And I know that's offensive to some people, but it's not. It's doing life with each other and holding each other accountable. Again, David, in Psalm 51, when he said, create in me a clean heart, a few verses later, he says, then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will return to you. I love what the writer of Hebrews says in this. Look at what he says in 1024. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. You don't, you don't do that with a multi-step plan. You don't do that with a, with a multiple process scripture reading plan. Not that those aren't important. They are. We just said we got to abide in God's word constantly. We got to do life with each other. It is crucial that we do life with each other. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but what? Encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Here's the deal. That day's got a capital D. There's a reason why. That's judgment day. That's when Jesus comes back. You do realize all the prophecies have been fulfilled. You do realize he could come back right now. And when he does, it's game over. It's game over. Our fate's sealed. For eternity. Eternity. Do we get that? Because it is. It is sealed for eternity when Jesus Christ comes back. Please don't miss this. We have got to start doing life with each other and building each other up, bearing one another's burdens. Man, this men's group this past Thursday night, one of our men opened up about his wife struggling with cancer. Just an amazing saint. Amazing. And he's asking us to pray for God to give him the grace 
that he can get through burying his wife. And we prayed over him. And he told me what, how, that, how that fulfilled him. And guess what? That, we're not stopping there. We've got a group of ladies who have been meeting with her because she can't come here because her, her antibodies and her immune system's at zero from all the chemo and radiation. And unless God does a miracle, she will not see Easter. She won't. They are the, they are the picture of a beautiful, beautiful marriage in the eyes of God in Christ Jesus. They're amazing. We've got women that go over and meet with her and fellowship with her. She's never even been here. She can't be here because of her immune system. The cold could kill her. And she loves that fellowship. And it's sharpening the ladies who are going to visit with her. God, listen, <laughs> that's discipleship. That is discipleship. I figure I get a couple more amens. I get it. I get it. It's unorthodox. From all the seminaries and everything else, trust me, I went to it. They had this long thing about how to do discipleship. It's doing life with each other. It's doing life with each other. It's doing life with each other. I get it. It takes time. I get it. It takes W-O-R-K. I get it. It takes you having to clear your schedule to meet with the saints of the church. You can't afford not to. Lastly, you probably can guess this one. Abide with Jesus. You probably can guess what verse I'm going to quote because I quote it almost every single Sunday. Listen, we're not strategic here. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Absolutely nothing. We got to spend time with Jesus. It's funny, one of our, one of the, our attenders here so Nathan, I've actually put the chair in front of me and I act like Jesus is sitting there and it's helped so much. I do that too. And listen, I'm not perfect. Listen, there's times that I don't, that I don't abide with Jesus like I should. There's times that I use my sermon prep for my quiet time and I shouldn't do that. That's wrong. And y'all, y'all, y'all pray for me because I should not use sermon prep to be my time with God. That is wrong. A lot of pastors make that mistake and I don't wanna get on that trajectory where I'm like, oh, well, I'm preparing a message. That's my quiet. No, 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 no. I need you to spend time with God, bask in his glory. Say, man, what, what, do you, what will you have for me next, God? What will you have for me next? What ministry does Hendersonville Church need to start? And listen, there's a bunch that Ryan and I would love to start right now. I would love to start a student ministry. We, we, don't, we don't have somebody God's raised up to lead it. And when someone feels called, they will be called of God to do it. By the way, um, you know what God told me when I was getting real upset about it? He says, hey, Nathan, why don't you go in my book I wrote you and find student ministry in Acts? Uh-oh, it's not there. It's not there. Sorry, parents, it's your job to disciple your kids. I said it. I'm sorry. And yes, Paul did say, I became all things to all people, my women, the gospel. So yeah, we need to start it. We're going to on God's time. Our strategy here is to abide in Jesus. And we're gonna do what he tells us to do when he tells us to do it. And if we stay true to that, he will always give us exactly what we need to do, exactly what he wants us to do. Always. Good grief, if the past 18 months haven't proved that, I don't know what will. You could have told me a year ago we had owned this building in October, and I would have said, you're crazy, but God. So I've got that list up there. Now, I want to I focus on two men in recent history that I think exude and personify courage. The first one you may have heard of, his name's Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor started the first big missionary movement into China, back in the, in the mid to late 1800s, okay? Here's what's interesting. Um, he never asked for money, never. Everybody told me he was crazy. He even told the missionaries there's no guarantee of salary. None. That sound familiar, Ryan? Ryan came on board, I said, look, man, I, three months, I, maybe we can pay y'all, but I, after that, dude, it's up to God. I don't know what to tell you. You want to be real? I'm being real. But here's the thing. He, he literally, he prayed for 70 missionaries one year. He got 72. 
He prayed for 100. The next year, he got 102. This is all fact. You can look it up. He lost his wife. He lost his four kids in China. Now, you may say, by the, by the, by the climax, by the time he had retired, and he couldn't go any further, he had 800 missionaries and 125 schools in China. I think it was like 1910. And here's the crazy thing. Right now, if you're talking about real Christ followers, not people that check a box on a Sunday morning, I'm talking about real Christ followers, there's probably more in China than there are in America. And you want to know the funny thing? You look at the stats, Chinese government, you know how many Christians they'll say is there? There's an estimate of 130 million. And let me tell you something, China's starting to crack down. They are. Now, I want to tell you about another person you've probably not heard of. His name is William Borden. William Borden was, was a multi, multi-millionaire from a prestigious family based on mining silver. For his 16th birthday, his parents sent him on a, on a world safari to go see China, Africa, everything else. He, his mom got saved, took him to uh, a church service, then he got just radically transformed. And so he really wanted to be a missionary. He, he, he went to Yale, and, and I just want to read what, what, because this is courage. Now, y'all pay attention here. This is what one of his roommates said. He came to college far ahead spiritually of any of us. He had already given his heart in full surrender to Christ and had really done it. We who were his classmates learned to lean on him and find in him a strength that was sought as a rock just because of this settled purpose and consecration. Wow. Okay, so here's what he does. It was his habit in Yale to seek out the most incorrigible, the, the meanest people to witness to to try to lead them to Christ. He led so many. By the end of his freshman year, he had 300 people in a Bible study at Yale. At the time, there were 1,300 students there, okay? He told all 300, hey, f- find somebody. By his junior year, there were 1,000 people in that Bible study. He started groups. He started the Yale Hope Mission where he was helping orphans and widows. You would commonly find him, again, multi, multi multi-millionaire. This guy would have had the last name of Musk or Bezos today. That's how wealthy he was. You would have found him on the streets with people struggling with alcoholism and he was helping get in a room and people were getting radically saved, starting a revival in New Haven, okay? So here's the thing. One person said, you're throwing your life away as a missionary. And he wrote down in his Bible, no reserves. No reserves. So he he turned down some high-paying job offers. People said, you're crazy. He wrote down something else in his Bible, no retreats. No retreats. He had a heart for the Uyghur Muslims, which you may have heard of in China right now. They're being horribly persecuted in China right now by the millions he had a heart for them. And so here was the, here's what God laid calling on his life. Again, multimillionaire. He goes to Cairo, Egypt to learn Arabic and to learn Islam so he can go into China because guess who he had read about? Hudson Taylor. Guess what he was a part of? The China Inland Mission that he found out about Hudson Taylor. See how this is all going? See the courage building up here? And so he gets to Cairo. Three days After he gets there, he contracts spinal meningitis and he's dead at the age of 25. When he had spinal meningitis, there was another word, another phrase written in his Bible. No regrets. No reserve. No retreats. No regrets. That's what this dude had written in his Bible. Listen, that's the kind of courage I want. I don't care about some dude that can run the 40 and 4-4. I don't care about somebody who can score 40 points in a basketball game. I don't care about that. I'm not saying it's wrong to care about it. That's courage. Hudson Taylor said this. When there were wars breaking out in China and, and Shanghai was basically burning to the ground, he, he had lost his wife, he had lost his four kids, and here, here's what he said. He, he said, um, sorry, he said some men die of shrapnel, while others go down in flames. But most men die inch by inch while playing at little games. 
what games are we playing? Because here's the thing. <laughs> 80,000 people in Henderson County. 20,000 in Transylvania County. Th that are not part of a local church. And if those people don't truly know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're going to spend eternity in hell. Now, how many of y'all cool with that? Because I'm not. And we're going to have to start living out like Jesus without agape love. That's what Paul did. That's what Jesus did. Listen, I, I don't care what your political beliefs are. I don't care what choices you've made. I just want to tell you about this guy named Jesus. Because here's the deal. Jesus says, hey, we're going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to get beat up by the Sanhedrin. I'm going to get handed over to the Romans. They're going to rip my torso to shreds. They're going to put a crown of thorns on me. And then they're going to crucify me. And then I'm going to die. And then three days later, I'm going to say, hey, what's up? And he did it with 500 people. You got to deal with the risen Messiah. Take everything else, put it on the shelf. You got to deal with the risen Jesus. That's courage. What's your next courageous step right now? Right now, what is it? Pull out that care card and write it down. What is your next tangible move right now? Don't walk out of here thinking that you don't have one because you do. Please don't walk out of here with a cool feeling and thinking how good God is. Please don't. What's your next move right now? What are you gonna do tomorrow morning? What are you gonna do? As a result of this message, if you care anything about what I just said, what are you gonna do tomorrow morning? How are you gonna live your life differently tomorrow night? How are you gonna live your life differently Friday night, Saturday night, Saturday morning? Serious, guys. I love y'all. I wanna do life with y'all. I wish I could make more time because I love the heck out of y'all. My wife told me not to say snot anymore, so... I almost said love the snot out of y'all. She's like, yeah, Nathan, I just don't know about the whole snot thing. I'm like, okay. I said, what about poo-poo? She said, poo-poo's okay. I said, okay, fine. <laughs> but here's the thing. I, I love y'all. I want us to change the world for Jesus like William Borden did. The dude died when he was 25. He wasn't in Cairo for a month, and he was dead. No retreat, no reserves, no regret. Wow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, God, thank you for what your message taught us today. Man, oh man, the courage that Paul and Silas and Timothy and Barnabas and, and even Peter, my, my goodness, it's insane what those guys went through. They were all killed or exiled. Their families were killed. You look at Hudson Taylor, buried his wife in China, buried four of his eight kids in China. Hudson Taylor used to always say, you know what, it doesn't matter how great the pressures are in life. Just see to it they don't come between you and God. Therefore, the greater the pressure, the greater it presses you up to him. God, I so want their courage. God, that only comes from you though. That only comes from spending time with you, God. And just saying, God, what's the next thing you want me to do? The next one thing. Heavenly Father, you... King Jesus only did one thing when he was on this planet. Only one, your will. That's it. He did it 168 hours a week. God, please equip this group of people at Hendersonville Church. God, what you've done at this church in the last 18 months in the middle of a pandemic, here, here's the beautiful thing. Anyone who, who takes a light look at Hendersonville Church, they know it's got absolutely nothing to do with Nathan Bird. It's all you. God, let us, it doesn't matter if we start two services, if we're running five, 600 people, God, we need you just as bad then. God, never let us have a quote unquote strategy. Our strategy is you. Our strategy is abiding in you. Our strategy is doing what you tell us to do no matter how it looks. Man, oh man, Paul and Silas and going from city to city and, and getting kicked out and getting beaten and I mean, just torn to shreds. And the first thing they did when they go into another city is they go straight and they share Jesus. God, if there's anyone here that doesn't have that peace and that joy that comes from your son, 
in a relationship with him. God, please, 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 please let him fill out a care card. Or if they want us to faithfully pray for someone, God, have them fill out that care card. God, we love you. Thank you for what your word has taught us today, God. But please, please, please let it go into our mind, permeate our mind, and then God, travel to our heart and let us live it out Monday through Monday. We wanna give you all the praise and glory and honor. Pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.